طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد please forgive me I'm going to have to bend over this the wire just doesn't come out long enough um, the discussion for tonight is one that I've, I've probably heard in a number of spaces in a number of places on what does it actually mean to take the good and leave the bad and I think Sometimes this becomes a very subjective discussion based on who is presenting it and who is talking about it and the perspective and the viewpoint that they're trying to present or maybe a possible agenda that they're trying to push. Because many times what we'll see is that a person will say anybody who doesn't agree with me is the bad person and therefore that person needs to be left and anything that I say is good, and this is why it is important for you to adhere to it. So the question then comes, all right, what do I do? Like, what am I supposed to do? If there are people out there like that who have this agenda, or maybe truly believe that the truth is in their hands, right? And there are people out there like that. Who am I supposed to listen to? Who do I take from? And I want to show you how easy it is to polarize an audience, okay? So I'm going to use examples. I, I, not to say I might adhere to some of these things. I might not. But I, these are things that I want you all to hear just for us to kind of do, de, uh, develop that own, our own gauges in our hearts. So the first is, okay, how do I develop this gauge? We go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, in tattakullah yaji'al lakum furqana, wa yukafir ankum sayyatikum, wa yaghfir lakum, wallahu dhul fadl al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse, believers, if you remain mindful of Allah, He will give you a criteria. He will give you this criteria to judge between right and wrong. And wipe out your bad deeds and forgive you. Allah's favor is great indeed. And this, this verse is the one that should be thematic for this entire discussion. If I want to determine what is right and I want to determine what is wrong, then the key ingredient to that is having taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal, then He is the one that will give me this gift. And the moment I do not have taqwa of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove that gift from me. Right? This is conditional. That He Azza wa Jal says, in taqullah, right? So if, if, right? This is a conditional statement. If you have taqwa of Allah, then Allah will give you this furqan, He will give you this ability to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. So now comes the question, okay, how do we gain taqwa? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us different means to do that. And I'm not going to get into too many details on how that is to be achieved, but I think it's very important for us to understand just in general there are two major ways of doing this. Firstly, the pillars of these ways, and this is important, is that we have ikhlas lillah azza wa jal, that we are sincere, and that we follow the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Putting that aside and understanding that there are two means and methods that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us in order to attain this taqwa. The first of them is a structured type of ibadah, whether it be prayer, whether it be fasting, whether it be making hajj. These are very dictated, structured types of worship that we have to follow in order for those deeds to be accepted. I cannot make sajda before I make ruku'a. I cannot add a rakah. I cannot subtract a rakah. I cannot make hajj today because it's too busy during the hajj season. I cannot add a half percent or one percent or five percent to zakah because I feel that the needy are more in need of that. I'm not allowed to change any of these structures. The other way is for me to take advantage of unstructured worship. And what are those things? Doing adhkar. If I feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted me in some way, shape, or form, if I say subhana rabbi al-wahab, Right? If I, I say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that gifts and bestows these gifts, I have every right to do that and this is my creative expression to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hopes that He rewards me because I am resonating with this name at that time and at that moment. The other opportunity I have and which many of us, if not most of us do, alhamd, is making dua. And with dua, it takes time, it takes effort and this is something that we unfortunately have fallen practice out of. The things that we tend to ask for are those things that give immediate gratification, whether it be work, whether it be for some of us maybe marriage, uh, whether it be getting a better job, getting more money. And there's nothing wrong with these dua. But if we really truly want a change in our life, then asking for tamanin, right, asking to be content, asking to be courageous, asking to be brave, asking to be trustworthy, 
asking to be honest. These are the things that are actually going to bring long-term contentment and bring that change. So now the question comes, okay, well, what is right and what is wrong? How do I determine that? And this is very simple also. I would say going back to the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has defined this in the hadith of Jibreel. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but just to recall sections of it, Jibreel alayhi salam, he asked three major questions, and then he ends with talking about the signs of the hour. And those three major questions are, what is Islam? What is Iman? And what is Ihsan? So if someone comes to me and they say, what is good? What are the things that I need to know? What are the things that are necessary for me? I need to pray. I need to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to believe in His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I need to pray. I need to fast. I need to give zakah. I need to give hajj. These are all of the superficial deeds and actions that are required from me. And these, by agreement, are things that are good. No difference. What are the other things that are good? The internal aspects. What are those internal aspects? Believing in Allah. Believing in His books. Believing in His angels. Believing in His messengers. Believing in the Day of Judgment. Believing in the Qadr. The Divine Pre-Decree. Those six pillars also agreed upon that those things are good. What are the other things that are good? This idea of ihsan, this idea of tazkiyat al-nafs, this idea of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cleaning our hearts. This is also something that is agreed upon to be good. They, what is bad? The bad things are the things that are the muharramat and mujma' alayha. The things that are agreed upon to be haram. And what are those things? Lying, stealing, backbiting, taking advantage of others, oppression. Hurting others, murder, zina, these are all agreed upon. So where does this become a problem and where does it become an issue? Is when we start entering some of these gray areas and we start using them as tools to judge others and think that we are standing our own moral pedestal to look down. Because yes, we all agree that riba is haram, there's no doubt. But then why do we get into fights about whether I can buy a home? or whether I can buy a car, or whether certain types of investments are permissible. Because this is where we start enter entering gray areas. And if the moment, and I, this is something that I want all of us to take home tonight, the moment that I know and I am aware that there is a difference of opinion on an issue, I have no right to impose on another. Simple as that. If somebody's lying, I have every right to call them out. If somebody's stealing, I have every right to call them out. If somebody's not praying, I have every right to call them out. If somebody buys a house through a conventional mortgage, I have no right to call that person out. If I decide that I'm going to rent for the rest of my life, the one who bought his house, he has no right to call that person out and say, you're wasting your money. This judgmentalism is something that we all suffer from and we all hate. And it's amazing how if we look at the prophetic model, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him very clearly. لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّ غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ had you been hard-hearted and stern, then the people would turn away from you. And that's exactly what happens when we say, you did this, and you bought that, and you did this, and this is israf, you're, uh, you, this is excessive expenditure, and this, and you're doing this and that. How much will the people like me? These are the type of people we tend to avoid. These are the type of people we tend to stay away from. And if I truly feel that I'm right, and if I truly feel that I am correct, then is this the way to advise? Is this how I would approach something? Brother, what you're doing is haram. Sister, the way you're wearing this is not permissible. Your prayer was not accepted. How often have we all heard of these things and heard of these conversations? Extremely problematic. Because yes, the one to judge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt about that. But these things that are agreed upon, nobody can come and tell me like, Akhi, you need to pray. And I tell him only Allah will judge me. But this is something that's agreed upon. Or I go and I lie and say, only Allah will judge me. Yeah, I'm talking about your lie. We're not talking about your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I really want that furqan, if I want to be the one that has that criteria to determine between good and bad, then this is where the taqwa will come in. Because it'll help me with my relationships and dealing with other people. In the moment I feel like I need to tell someone something, that is not taqwa. I guarantee that's not taqwa. It's just my own arrogance and my own ego. Because if I really cared about this individual, if I cared about this person who I call my brother, or this woman who I call my sister, if I truly cared, I would try to build a relationship with that person, introduce myself, who are you, hey, are you new to the community, etc. And then after that, be like, hey, I saw you doing such and such, why is that? And how come we don't do that? Because it's harder. Because it requires more of an investment. But just like Jibreel salam said, that the path to paradise is surrounded by difficulties and hardships. 
And building those relationships is hard and it's difficult. We don't have to become someone's best friend, but asking somebody's name, are we beyond that? Do we not have that ability? And the reason we don't, like I said, is because we feel so good about ourselves. We are so full of ourselves that we do not have to lower ourselves and humble ourselves to talk to the person in front of us. But that's how I show I truly care. And that is the thamra to taqwa. That is the fruit of taqwa. If I truly have that taqwa, then it's going to show in how I deal with others. And how do I know that and how can I claim that? Because the pinnacle of mankind, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was just like that. He was approachable, he was kind, he was generous, he was positive and lighthearted. People enjoyed being around him. And someone might say, well, how did he become like that? It is because of his taqwa. It's because of how much awareness and God consciousness that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had. And that is what we need to embody. That is what we need to exemplify. And that will help us become good and bad. That will help us determine. And the other thing that we need to ask ourselves, and I promise I said I would polarize everyone. I say, if I claim, if I said to you I'm Sufi, how many people would walk out the room today? If I said to you I'm Ashari, how many people would rock, walk out the room today? If I said to you if I'm Maturidi or Hanbali, how many people would walk out the room today? And we need to ask ourselves, is this me following tribalism? Me trying to be part of a particular group or accepted in a particular social circle? Or is this an example of my taqwa? Or is my furqan, is my meter skewed? It's amazing how the only criteria Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent was this book in his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how we decided we needed to add more criteria. And we decided that we needed, we needed more rules. This is not enough to judge people. This means that I'll have to be too kind. This means I'll have to drop my standards too much. This is what it means to be Muslim. That we understand and we deal with it's, it's amazing, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakrin wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. That, O oh people, we have made you into nations and tribes, or we have made you into man and woman, nations and tribes, so that you may recognize one another. He highlights the differences between people. It's amazing. He highlights the differences between people. He doesn't talk about how we're all the same. How we're all from the different backgrounds, even though the first audience were pure Arabs. A hundred percent, a hundred percent of the audience that was intended when this verse was first revealed were two Arabs, where there weren't too many differences. And all you have to do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew, look around, the ro look around the room, just this room, forget the rest of the world. Just look around the room and look at the variety of faces and shapes, languages, families, where are we coming from? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this is for you, this is your test. Can you deal with those differences or not? That's the question. Can you deal with those differences or not? And it's amazing how that one religious portion, even that I don't think is as polarizing as taking a political position. If I stood up here and I said I support Trump, imagine how many people walked out of this room. Or I supported Biden, Genocide Joe, and I said we need to walk out of the room. So politics. Politics, these are political, these are theory, these are administrative theories on how to judge and rule government. And I have decided to make my identity on who I side with from, some, from people who are imposing policies on us that we completely disagree with. This is something I want all of us to think about. Why is that? How did we come to this point? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لِتَعَرَفُ So that you may know one another. But we said no, لِتَعَادُوا So that we may be enemies with one another. And this is where the taqwa is gone. We want to know why is that happening? Because there's no taqwa. That's why it's happening. The shortcoming is within us. The shortcoming is here. It's not the Zionists, I promise. It's not the Freemasons or the Illuminati. Nobody's coming into our home and saying, oh, you need to mess up your relationships like this. This is, this is all me. All of it. I have no one to blame except myself. And if I want to fix it, Allah has given me the opportunity. He's given me his book. It's amazing. SubhanAllah, growing up, the only time that, and I mean, I'm older, I'm not that old, but like growing up, I had access to Qur'ans because we had to actually go and buy one and you needed to get a physical copy. There's no one in this room today that has not downloaded a Qur'an app onto their phone. That's how available it is. And we wonder why we're astray. We wonder why our relationships are poor. We wonder why we can't speak to one another. 
we wonder why we can't sit down with opponents. And political opponents, really? That's, that's where you're going to draw the line? Is, is that really where we have become and like fall, fall into as an ummah? And someone might come and say, okay, no, I'm, I, don't, I don't really deal with politics. I'm okay with that. That doesn't bother me. The first set of questions that I had, well, what polemic school do you follow? What fiqh school do you follow? Do you associate with Madrasa Dioband? Are you one of the Khaliji institutions? Are you an Azhari? Are you Qairawani? And I want to share with you a story, and I'm probably going to close with this, inshallah. Imam Ghazali, he actually left uh, Madrasa Nidhamiya. He left it. So Madrasa Nidhamiya was the biggest madrasa of the time. This is where Imam Haramein Juwaini, he was a teacher there, uh, very famous. And Ghazali was like, I'm, I'm done with this. He was like, I'm done. And they were like, why? Why, why? why are you leaving? Like, you're such a bright student with a huge future. Historically, we need to understand why is it that many of these madaris came into such prominence, right? Like, why was it equivalent to like Harvard or Yale today? Because the same thing with Harvard, Yale, Columbia, UPenn, whatever the university might be, it becomes much easier to secure a job. So if I go to Madrasa Nilamiya during the time of Imam Ghazali, I would be guaranteed a state job. Either I could be a scribe, I could be a judge, right? I can get into the politics, I can move up in different positions. That's why it was such a big deal. And he walked away from that. Imagine being a full ride to Harvard, you study for two years, you're like, yeah, I'm good. And why? Because he didn't like the culture. He said, I couldn't stand walking around and seeing the scholar class being followed by a flock of students. He said, all of a sudden, their dress became different. They started standing out. And it, I didn't have the patience for it. So what did he do? He went to Damascus and he started working as a janitor because he wanted to completely remove himself from that lifestyle. And this is, subhanAllah, so representative of the prophetic model. When the Bedouin man, he walked into the masjid and he looked around and he said, Man minkum Muhammad. He said, which one of you is Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't dress any different. He didn't sit up any higher than anyone. He was sitting with the people, conversing with them, talking with them. To the point that the Arabi, this Bedouin man, he looked around and he, he couldn't tell. He was like, wh wh who's the guy that everybody's you know, listening to? Who, who's the guy that everybody wa wants, you know what I mean? Like, every, everybody wants to listen to and speak to. Why, why is it that he's not dressed any different than anyone else? So we, re we really need to look at the culture that we are creating. Because we are the ones that are creating this polarized culture. We can't blame it on anyone else. We can't speak to anyone else. We have decided to embody it. We have decided to take it on. And if we want that furqan, then we need to come back to this idea of taqwa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the muttaqeen.